Hey everybody, welcome to Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. This is episode number 400 of our YouTube channel and podcast, and I cannot be more excited to continue sharing with you guys personal finance topics that I think can be useful for you in your long-term financial journey. I can't believe that this is the 400th episode. I'm super excited uh, that I've made it this far, 400 episodes. Um, it's it's crazy, uh, but we're just going to keep chugging right along. We're nowhere near the end of the line here, but 400 just seems super substantial, so I thought I'd recognize it there uh, for a moment. But nonetheless, uh, today we are going to be talking about taxes, right? And uh, specifically because, you know, it's that time of year. It's tax time of year. It's getting really uh, close to the time when many people will file. Uh, I know it's not uh, quite mid-April uh, yet, but a lot of people file before that to get their uh, refunds and things like that. So I want to talk about taxes, exactly, um, you know, the different types of taxes, uh, what we should be thinking about when uh, we are going about, you know, filing our tax returns and um, just all things taxes, right? All things taxes for the individual, because this is a fundamental Friday episode. And so I want to really break down um, how the tax system works, what you need to pay taxes on, how much taxes you end up paying and why that is the case. Uh, so stick around for a discussion of all that and more in today's episode. Before we get started, though, if you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to respond to anything you leave down there. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan. And that's really good supplemental materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form episodes on YouTube and the podcast every single day. And then if you need somebody to help you to build a financial plan and keep you accountable to that plan over the long term, then I can do that. Just DM me on any of the major social media sites and tell me that you are interested in financial coaching sessions. And you and I can begin working together, pushing towards your long-term financial goals and ultimately pushing you on towards long-term financial freedom, which is what I hope for every single individual who's watching or listening to this show on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I know that we all hate taxes, right? Nobody likes paying taxes, right? I don't care if you are Elon Musk and you pay more taxes than anybody's ever paid or the person who's constantly, you know, griping about so-and-so should pay more or whatever. I don't think anybody likes the idea of taxes or paying taxes, right? You may willingly pay them. That's fine, right? But I don't think anybody likes it. So I want you to know more about it. I don't think many people understand taxes that well and exactly how they work. So I, I want to make it simple for you. I want to make it as palatable as possible because this is a fundamental Friday episode. So I want to be uh, very straightforward, uh, but I also want to dig into like, you know, how can we decrease our taxable income in a legal way, in a very real way? And how can we uh, be thoughtful about, um, you know, the opportunities that we have to decrease our taxes over time? So most taxes can be divided into three buckets, right? Uh, there's basically taxes on what you earn, taxes on what you buy, and taxes on what you own, okay? Now, it's important to remember that every dollar that you pay in taxes starts as a dollar earned as income, every single dollar, right? Now, one of the main differences among the tax types outlined uh, is the point of collection. In other words, when you pay the tax, because even though uh, it may not be directly a tax on what you earn, you may have used what you earned to buy something and then have to pay taxes on that thing. So you would pay a tax on what you own, right? So it's all about when you pay the tax. So for example, if you earn $1,000 in a state with a flat income tax rate of 10%, $100 in income taxes should be withheld from your paycheck when you earn that income. If a week later you take $100 from your remaining earnings uh, to purchase a new smartwatch in a jurisdiction with a 5% sales tax, you'll pay an additional $5 in taxes when you purchase that item, right? So that's a tax on what you buy. Altogether, $105 of your initial $1,000 in income has been collected in taxes, not just uh, that $100, and those amounts weren't collected at the same time. With that in mind, uh, let's look at a brief overview of the main types of taxes and what you should know to be an educated taxpayer, okay? So first are taxes on what you earn. And this is... Uh, probably the taxes that we pay the most attention to, right? And an individual income tax is levied on the wages, salaries, investments, or other forms of income an individual or household earns, right? Uh, so individual income taxes. These are the income taxes that come out of your check, right? These are the ones that you are most concerned about. Now, I said on salaries, wages, investments, right? 
Well, with investments, you're only paying the individual income tax rate if the following is the case, right? Uh, if you are receiving interest off of, let's say, a bond, right? Then you would pay income tax on that if that is within a taxable account, right? All of this is if it's within a taxable account. If it's in an IRA, 401k, whatever, right? Then investments are not going to be taxed, right? And then you could also have a capital gain. So the growth of a particular investment, and then you realize it, meaning you sold. Uh, and so you realize that gain and you do so within a year. If you do so within a year, that would be taxed at the individual income tax rate. And then there are other situations, other types of, uh, you know, dividend income, whatever that may be at the individual income tax rate. Uh, but that's what we mean when we talk about investments, but salaries and wages, that's just what comes out of your check, right? Now, many individual income taxes are progressive. Right? This means that tax rates increase as a taxpayer's income increases, resulting in higher earners paying a larger share of income taxes than lower earners. And you may say, well, isn't this against the entire narrative? Isn't this against the narrative of, um, you know, the rich don't pay their fair share? Well, people say the rich don't pay their fair share because they're talking about wealth, right? They're talking about it as a percentage of their assets, not a percentage of what they earn. Right. Obviously, the higher earners, the higher incomes um, are going to pay higher amounts in taxes. Right. The U.S., for example, levies income tax rates ranging from 10 percent to 37 percent that kick in uh, at a specific income threshold uh, that we can sit here and talk about. Right. So let's just talk about the 2021 2022 tax bracket. So um, if you look at I'll, I'll start with single filers. Right. Um, and we can just talk about how all of this works um, because married filing jointly or, you know, the head of household or whatever, it all works the same, but the brackets are just different. It's just larger amounts for those different, um, you know, filing types. So if you make zero to $9,950 uh, in the United States, right, in taxable income, you owe 10% of your taxable income in taxes, right? So just straight up 10%. Then if you make anywhere from $9,951 to $40,525, again, this is a single filer, right? You would pay $995 plus 12% of the amount over $9,950. So we see a couple things here. One, progressive tax system, right? One, as you make more money, you pay a higher percentage in taxes. But also, uh, we see where uh, these tax rates also are not just like flat rates, right? They're not just rates that you pay. So for instance, if I make $40,000 and I'm a single filer, I don't pay 12% of $40,000 as my taxes. That's not what I owe, right? I pay, so you go back to the previous tax bracket, I pay $995. So uh, that is the 10% of the high end of the previous tax bracket, right? So I pay $995 plus 12% of the amount over that $9,950. So basically you pay the maximum amount for the previous um the previous bracket, and then you go and you pay uh, whatever tax you know bracket you're in. So in this case, the 12%, you pay 12% of the amount over that up to $40,525 in this case, right? So if we just wanted to look at this, for instance, right, if you made $40,000 a year, right, uh, what your effective tax rate is. Effective tax rate simply means the amount you really end up paying. Even though you may be in the 12% tax bracket, you don't end up actually paying 12%, right? So uh, with a $40,000 uh, income, if you were to pay 12% uh, of that, that would be $4,800, okay? That'd be $4,800 that you ended up paying. So let's see what you actually end up paying. So it says you end up paying $995 plus, right, plus 12% uh, of anything above, right, the uh, $9950, right? So we would want to take $40,000 minus $9950, right? And multiply that by uh, the 0.12. So you would end up paying uh, $4,601 uh, in taxes instead of $4,800. And so that would make your effective tax rate 11.5% uh, instead of 12%, right? So naturally that's how your tax brackets are gonna work. 
And as you jump up in uh, tax brackets, and the more that you're not towards the upper range, there I put it very close to the upper range of that tax bracket, right? Let's say that you're in the 24% tax bracket, but that runs from 86, 376 to 164, 925 in income, right? Let's say you made $100,000 in income, right? You're not going to pay anywhere near a total of 24% on that $100,000, right? So our effective tax rates end up being lower based on this particular system that we uh, have and that we outline. So that is how our income gets taxed. Now, that is not the only type uh, of taxes on what is earned, right? There are also corporate income taxes. So the corporate income tax is levied by federal and state governments on business profits, which are revenues minus costs. Businesses in the U.S. broadly fall into two categories. There are C corporations, which pay the corporate income tax and pass-throughs, uh, such as partnerships, S corporations, LLCs, and sole proprietorships, which pass their income through to their owner's income tax returns and pay the individual income tax rate. So while C corporations are required to pay the corporate income tax, uh, the burden of the tax falls not only on the business, but also on its consumers and employees through higher prices and lower wages, right? Because as taxes are going to be higher um, than what's naturally going to happen for these corporations, they're going to look to cut costs in any way possible. So they may look to um, pay lower wages. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this is what they'll do, right? Um, so they'll have lower wages typically. And then naturally, they may not want to cut costs as much. Maybe they just want to increase revenues so that they can uh, pay their taxes. And so they'll do that through higher prices and they'll pass the taxes right on to the consumer. Now, due to their negative economic effects over time, more countries have shifted to taxing corporations at rates lower than 30%, including uh, the United States, uh, which lowered its federal income tax rate to 21% as a part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. All right, so there are corporate tax rates. Then there are also payroll taxes, right? So payroll taxes are taxes paid on the wages and salaries of employees to finance social insurance programs like uh, Social Security, right? Most taxpayers will be familiar with payroll taxes from looking at their pay stub at the end of each pay period, uh, where the amount of payroll tax withheld by their employer from their income is clearly listed, right? In the U.S., the largest payroll taxes are 12.4% uh, tax to fund Social Security and a 2.9% tax to fund Medicare for a combined 15.3%, half of which is paid by employers and then half of which is paid by employees, right? Then there are capital gains taxes, okay? So again, these are taxes on what you earn, right? That we're, talk we're all talking about taxes on what you earn here. Now, capital gains uh, taxes, they are when you have capital assets, right? Which are generally everything uh, owned and used for personal purposes, pleasure or investment, including stocks, bonds, homes, cars, jewelries, art, whatever, right? Whenever one of those assets increases in value, right? So when stock goes up, the result is what's called a capital gain, okay? Uh, in jurisdictions with a capital gains tax, when a person realizes a capital gain, i.e. Uh, sells an asset uh, that has increased in value, they pay tax on the profit that they earn. So that's a very clear distinction. They're not paying tax on the entire amount that they receive. They're paying tax on just the profit that they earn. So if you had a $100 share of stock, it went up to 200, you sold it, right? You will pay taxes on $100, the gain on that share of stock. Now, when applied to profits earned from stocks, capital gains taxes result in the same dollar being taxed twice, also known as double taxation. That's because corporate earnings are already subject to the corporate income tax, all right? So this would be a double taxation of like dividends, right? Because a company, they pay taxes on their earnings, uh, and then ultimately uh, when dividends are paid, then what? Then the uh, the owner, the shareholder, gets taxed on those dividends, right? So it's a double taxation there. Um, and ultimately, we say double taxation there. There's a ton of situations in which, you know, the same money gets taxed multiple, multiple times. We talked about one earlier where you have your income taxed and then you pay taxes on, um, you know, sales tax and, you know, whatever else, right? But double taxation of dividends uh, would be a situation that comes up quite often. Now, it's not necessarily a double tax when it comes to just increases in value uh, because that's not directly, you know, 
the uh, earnings taxed by the corporation creating uh, the new value, right? Dividends, it's clear, right? Dividends must come from earnings, retained earnings, or whatever you know money that you have set aside as a corporation, right? But the increase in value via just a normal capital gain is not necessarily uh, not necessarily that, right? The corporation's not already paying taxes on that particular gain. Now, that's taxes on what you earn. Then what about taxes on what you buy, right? Well, uh, taxes on what you buy would be like sales taxes, gross receipt taxes, value added taxes, excise taxes, all those types of things. I'm not going to dig into those too much. We know what those are in general. And if you don't, then some of them, some of them are not things that you actually have to deal with um, in your particular tax situation. Then there are taxes on what you own, right? There are property taxes. We all know, you know, about having to pay property taxes. There are tangible personal property taxes, right? Um, there are estate and inheritance taxes, uh, which are really only important if you've got over a certain amount uh, of wealth in the U.S. today. And then there are wealth taxes, right? Um, and this is just from your net worth that you may actually have to pay based on where you live. The United States doesn't have one currently, but there are other countries that do. So those are the different types of taxes, right? Now, the whole point is not just, hey, we've got all these taxes, right? It's the fact that we want to decrease our taxes if at all possible. And we're all going about filing our taxes and seeing all these different words thrown around. Um, so we want to better understand how do we decrease uh, our taxable income, right? So ultimately, uh, the first way that we go about doing this is this idea of deductions. Now, there are deductions and there are credits. And what deductions do is they decrease the amount of taxable income that you have, right? So if you have $100,000 income and $10,000 worth of deductions, right, then you have a taxable income of $90,000, right? So you pay taxes on $90,000 worth of income. But let's say you have um, $100,000 income and you get a $10,000 tax credit, right? That means that you're still going to pay income on the $100,000. That means that you're still going to pay income taxes on the $100,000, but you get $10,000 just given to you. It's a credit, right? It's given to you to go up against the amount of taxes that you end up paying. So let's say you paid 20% of your income in taxes, right? That's $20,000. Well, that can get decreased down to $10,000 via the tax credit. You could juxtapose that with the idea of um, the deduction, right? If you had the $10,000 deduction and you still stayed in a, a 20% uh, percent tax bracket, you would still pay $18,000 in taxes. It only decreased your taxes in this you know, example by $2,000 to get the $10,000 deduction. But to get the $10,000 credit decreased the amount of taxes you had to pay by $10,000, right? Uh, so it's quite a bit of difference here. Now, the standard deduction is something that we hear a lot about, right? Um, we always have this option when we choose uh, to file our taxes, right? We have this option between itemized deductions or the standard deduction, right? If you file itemized deductions, you need to provide evidence of each item that you're deducting, right? Uh, which can be very time consuming, especially for the small deductions. Now, alternatively, if you don't think you have very much to deduct, you can just take the standard deduction, uh, which if you are a single uh, or married filing separately individual is $12,550. If you're married filing jointly, it is $25,100. And then if you file head of household, it's $18,800, right? So ultimately, this idea of the standard deduction decreases your taxable income uh, down to whatever a new amount would be. So let's say, just for instance, I want it to be easy math here. Let's say that you're married and you make $100,100, right, over the course of a year uh, and you're married filing jointly. That means that the standard deduction of $25,100 would decrease uh, your taxable income from $100,100 down to $75,000. And you would only have to pay taxes on $75,000, okay? Now, Many times the taxes that we get withheld from our check at our workplace take this into account, right? So it's not like we get a big tax windfall based on the fact that we took the standard deduction, uh, but uh, this is something that we need to understand when we go about filing our taxes. Now, if you take the standard deduction, right, you get it without having to provide any evidence of anything, 
right? Young people with lower incomes and no dependents generally find the standard deduction is bigger than their itemized deduction and is much easier to work with, work with. So basically you get these two choices. You can either take the standard deduction or itemize all your deductions um, and see which one decreases your taxable income the most. Now, the most common uh, tax deductions and credits involve families with dependents or children. Uh, in order to qualify as a dependent, a person must be under 18, uh, be related to you, have lived with you for more than half of the last year, and not be claimed by someone else as their dependent. So there's, uh, you know, dependents, there's the, you know, child tax credit, all those types of things, right? Those things can be very useful. Then there's also the earned income tax credit, right? The earned income tax credit is a national program to help raise lower and middle income workers out of poverty, specifically targeting families uh, as a refundable tax credit, right? Uh, while you don't necessarily need to have dependents to claim uh, the earned income tax credit, you'll get a lot more out of it if you do, right? Uh, this works by helping people with low income. This means that if you have uh, worked and earned some income for the previous year, uh, you might be eligible for this particular credit, right? So uh, the earned income tax credit you might be eligible for is shaped uh, like an N, right? You get very little uh, if you've earned very little, right? And then it rises with your income to a certain point before tapering off as your income continues to rise. This is because it's designed to encourage people to be working and earning a wage. For people with very little income coming from working, this gives very little because it works under the assumption that they are earning other benefits such as food stamps, housing, whatever, right? Uh, it rises in the middle to help the, work, the working poor escape poverty while tapering off as income continues to rise in order to reduce the benefits received by people who no longer require the assistance, right? So that can uh, decrease your taxable income quite substantially, right? And then I said there are tax credits and so there are, you know, child dependent uh, care tax credit. So, you know, if you get your child taken care of during the day and you pay for that, you can get a credit for that. Uh, then the federal child tax credit that, um, you know, was enhanced this past year that uh, you can um, have as well. Then there are, you know, work-related deductions that you may have, right? You may have job moving expenses, work equipment, you can deduct those. Um, there's home ownership. You can deduct the interest that you pay on your mortgage. You can get credits for energy. So for like, um, you know, putting on solar panels or uh, doing other green things to your home. You can write off a, a fair amount of student loan interest every single year. So your education can help you with your taxes. There's also the American Opportunity Tax Credit, um, which, you know, gives you money for educational expenses each year, but you need to be enrolled and you can only claim this for four years, right? Um, four years total. There's a lifetime learning tax credit, right? Which is very similar to the American Opportunity Credit, but with a lower threshold um, and it is non-refundable. So you can get this credit, but it, they're not gonna add it to your tax refund. It'll just decrease the amount that you pay in taxes. Uh, then there are situations with insurance and investments that ultimately can help you uh, as well uh, on your taxes. So advanced premium tax credit. So if you purchase healthcare uh, through healthcare.gov, right, the, the exchange, then uh, you can claim some of your premiums as a tax credit based on you know, your income and what your premiums are. Uh, there is the savers credit, right? This is another word for retirement savings contribution credit. Uh, the purpose is to encourage saving in retirement accounts. Um, this credits for up to $2,000 and is calculated as a percentage of your contributions. Uh, then there are capital losses. Now, capital losses are a pretty big deal when it comes to um, your taxes, right? If you have taxable investments, right? Uh, so if you have, you know, stocks, right? If you have property or any other type of taxable asset and like the stocks or the bonds or whatever need to be in a taxable brokerage account, right? And you end up selling it or realizing the loss. So selling it for less than you paid for it, right? Then you can write off or deduct up to $3,000 of losses against your income every single year. Uh, and obviously your losses, regardless of how much they are, uh, can negate capital gains um, in a much larger way than just $3,000 of your income, right? So there, ultimately, what I'm getting to here, there are tons of credits and deductions, right? But you need to be paying attention. You need to pay attention to the situations that you have going on in your life, right? Do you have taxable investments at a loss? 
do we, do you need to do some selling there in order to realize those losses at the end of the year? Um, you know, are you putting money away into an IRA to get the deduction or, um, are you, you know, paying on a mortgage? Okay. Well, I can write off my interest and all these different things. Now, something I will tell you is that even though there's all these credits and all these deductions, the credits can be quite valuable, especially the refundable ones. But with the standard deduction being as high as it is now, it's very difficult to get your deductions so high that they are above the standard deduction unless you have some um, very high income with very high deductions that come along with it, right? Um, so it's very difficult to get over that uh, amount. So your taxes don't have to be that uh, crazy, you know, just complex because the standard deduction is so high. But you do still want to pay attention to all the situations that you have. Um, and, you know, take care of things as need be. And, you know, the standard deduction being so high just gives all the more reason why we shouldn't worry too much about keeping a mortgage around for mortgage interest deductions. And, um, you know, we shouldn't worry about keeping student loans around for student loan interest deductions, because ultimately the likelihood that you reach the standard deduction is, is quite low, right? It's quite low that you actually reach the standard deduction. Uh, and so most people will take it. And if you take the standard deduction, then you know, your taxes become quite easy. But hopefully you get a little something from this and you understand um, that we have our three types of taxes, right? The taxes on what you earn, the taxes on what you buy, and the taxes on what you own. And then you can decrease your own taxable income via different credits and deductions and you can receive money back. Now, I will leave you with this. Unless you get some just like outstanding credits for one year. So for instance, my wife and I this year are receiving the child tax credit for the first time. So we're getting uh, a sizable refund for that. And we didn't receive a, um, a stimulus check for our son this uh, past year in 2021. So we'll receive that as well. So we're getting um, quite a large refund due to the credits uh, that we have. But otherwise, you're, um, you're, you shouldn't be getting a big refund. Right? People think that not getting a refund uh, is a bad thing. No, getting a refund is a bad thing. Getting a refund, a, a substantial refund, means that you loaned uh, the federal government money interest-free for an entire year, right? And or for most of a year, and then they're just giving it back to you. They're just giving it back to you interest-free, right? Uh, and so that is not a good value proposition. You, you want to decrease what your refund is. So that means that you would be maximizing uh, the amount of money that you get with each of your checks from uh, your job. So you want to make sure that you do the proper uh, due diligence with your workplace. Make sure that you're taking the, the correct amount out of your check every single week, month, whatever, right? Um, and then make sure that you can um, get as close to zero on that refund as possible, unless there are some um, just weird outstanding things that occur that, you know, some credits or whatever, where you actually do uh, get a refund. But other than that, you should pay as close to the correct amount as possible uh, and not be overpaying your taxes and getting a refund and then being happy about getting your own money back. So hopefully this helps you with your understanding of taxes, your understanding of credits and, dedu and deductions and uh, income taxes and capital gains taxes. And we could dig so much deeper, but I wanted to do a quick primer for you guys for a fundamental Friday and help you to understand taxes a little better uh, and hopefully help you to, to file your taxes in a way that's going to decrease your taxable income and decrease the taxes that you have to pay as much as possible. So thanks for watching this video. If you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below and I'll be sure to respond to anything you leave down there. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts, be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan. And that's really good supplemental materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form episodes on YouTube and the podcast every single day. And then if you need somebody to help you to build a financial plan and keep you accountable to that plan over the long term, then I can do that. Just DM me on any of the major social media sites and tell me that you are interested in financial coaching sessions. And you and I can begin working together, pushing towards your long-term financial goals and ultimately pushing you on towards long-term financial freedom, which is what I hope for every single individual who's watching or listening to this show on a day-to-day -day basis. So tune in Monday as I continue talking about personal finance topics that I think can be useful for you in your long-term financial journey. So thanks for tuning into this episode of Money's No Object, this 400th episode of Money's No Object. I'm very thankful for all you guys. Um, just tune in Monday and uh, I am your host, Dylan Howell. God bless.